All right, I think we can start now. Sounds great. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third talk of our 84 SD seminar series. Today, we're very happy to have Professor Sharon Yixin Lee to tell us about challenges and opportunities in out of distribution detection in an open world. Actually, last time, uh, Professor Dirich already introduced a bit of her, her work. So today, we are so very excited to hear about more details. Um, Sharon currently is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research develops algorithms and fundamental understandings to enable reliable open world learning, which can function safely and adaptively in the presence of evolving and unpredictable data stream. All right, thanks for Sharon uh, for joining us and uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Tali, for the very kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here at the Anomaly Detection for Scientific Discovery uh, seminar. I was able to attend some of the previous talks, and I want to you know, just say thank you to the organizers for uh, pulling together such a great event and bring together you know, the community who is interested in this uh, problem space. Um, so today, um, uh, I would like to share with you some of the uh, interesting challenges and uh, opportunities um, in out of distribution uh, detection. And so I would like to start my talk by showing you this video. Uh, this is a model trained on the uh, Berkeley Deep Drive 100K dataset performing bonding box tracking on the road in real time. And so whenever we see videos like this, uh, we may get this overly positive impression of how remarkable deep learning um, has become, which is indeed true in some scenarios. Uh, however, in my research, um, I try to encourage uh, researchers and practitioners to uh, look at the other side and uh, take a more cautious view at the methods and technologies that we've built, um, especially be aware of uh, the unexpected situations that the model uh, just wasn't trained for. And so hopefully by the end of the talk, we can see things uh, in a more well-rounded um, perspective. And so I know there are many experts in uh, uh, various disciplines uh, in statistics, machine learning, perhaps AI, and even more. Um, so let's maybe think for a second how you would approach um, building and deploying such a self-driving car model. Um, so to simplify the, the process, uh, we typically start with collecting some training data. Um, so you have uh, some corresponding labels to this um, to this video's frames. And then you can train on your favorite machine learning model. Uh, it could be in your network. And the output typically contains some predefined categories, such as, in this case, pedestrian cars um, and trucks and, and so on. Um, and of course, you know, there are thousands of details to sort through, you know, in, in practice when you're actually trying to build such a complex system. Um, but let's say, you know, once you finally have something that you think it's ready to go out in the real world, um, more unexpected work has just begun. Um, and then why do I say that? Because the real world is, you know, very much, um, to have this open world scenario where you have test data distributions that just doesn't match what the model was trained on. And a lot of unknowns could emerge. So for example, we took this image from the MS Coco dataset and to run through the self-driving car model that was just trained on the BDD dataset. And so you can see that uh, the model produced quite overconfident predictions for, this, for these objects, cow, uh, hanging out on the grass field, which was never exposed to the model during training time. So in other words, uh, deep neural networks do not necessarily know uh, what they don't know. Uh, and this has uh, raised significant uh, concerns on models reliability uh, because algorithms that classify these um, out of distribution objects um, into one of the uh, known classes, um, this can be catastrophic in, in some scenarios. Uh, for example, think about in healthcare, uh, a medical machine learning model, which is trained on the set of diseases, may encounter a different disease and it will cause mistreatment if not handled um, cautiously. 
by the way, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, ask questions during the talk. Um, you can, you know, either type in the chat um, or, you know, we can try to save some time and end um, to have this QA session, however works for you guys. Um, I definitely welcome questions. And so this issue is um, prevalent, um, not just for the high stake domains, um, but also in many other scenarios where machine learning is used on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is another ex favorite example of mine. So let's say you're, you know, imagine you're building an app of a food image classifier. And so that user can, you know, go to grocery store and snap a photo to get some inspiration for what to cook for dinner. As you can recommend some recipes. Um, and again, if you, you know, for those of you who have worked extensively with users data, um, you would know that how diverse and unpredictable it can be, right? There could be a lot of images other than food. Um, so this is precise the type of uh, quite messy, but fun data that I spent some time working with back in industry. And so my time working with this real world machine learning models has given me a firm belief on how important this uh, following problem is. Um, is how can we build unknown aware deep learning models um, for reliable decision making uh, in this open world scenario. Uh, by the way, Tali, feel free to maybe in interject if you, you know, uh, you, you see some questions popping up. I yeah, can't sure. have a chance right here. Thank you so much. Um, so an important step um, is um, to, you know, towards this more ambitious goal is to be able to detect out of distribution data in the first place. Um, so what is out of distribution data, um, you might ask. Um, I want to first provide a simple view on this. So let's say we have our training data distribution that is a mixture of two Gaussians for class label y equals to one and y equals to minus one. Um, and colored in uh, green and blue here. Um, so our in distribution uh, would be the marginal of the joint distribution over uh, the input space X. And during test time, these orange dots could emerge. Um, which are out of distribution from an unknown class, which does not belong to y equals to one or minus one. And therefore you don't want to uh, predict right on these orange dots um, as these green or blue dots. And to translate this toy data into some higher dimensional images, you can think of, for example, Cypher 10 as the in distribution on the left side and SVHN, which is straight view housing numbers as OOD. And these apparently have disjoint uh, labels, you know, between the digits and the, um, you know, the, the animal classes and trucks and so on. And I know you, th you might think this OOD is way too obvious, right, at least to, uh, to us human being. But I'm going to show you later how uh, such an easy setup could trouble uh, some of the, you know, high performing neural networks. Um, and later in this talk, I'll also discuss how we can go beyond such simplified definition um, and setting. Uh, but for now, let's stick with the simple view. And so SVHN is just one of the OOD uh, that the model would encounter. And there are, of course, many other unknowns um, on this very complex uh, high dimensional data manifold. Um, and this is a slide from a recent talk um, given by Alec Redford from OpenAI, uh, which I think very nicely illustrates the complexity of the problem. And so out of distribution detection is indeed a hard problem. And let me explain to you why before we attempt any solution. So the first challenge is the lack of supervision from unknowns during the training time. So the models are typically trained um, on the in-distribution data, in this case, the green and blue dots um, using, say, um, empirical risk minimization. And you can't really anticipate uh, where these orange dots uh, could emerge in advance because there is a huge space of unknowns, um, and especially in the high dimensional space, right? Um, what I'm showing you here is just a simple 2D illustration, but if you extrapolate this to be 
much, much higher dimensional space, um, you're going to have a lot more uncertainty there. And the problem is further exacerbated by this high capacity neural networks that we're working with nowadays, right? Those are highly expressive uh, function approximators. Um, so if you look at the decision boundary, which in this case tries to distinguish between uh, the orange and the uh, blue dots here. So these are the two in-distribution classes um, and the decision boundary is uh, kind of in the middle. And this undesirably covers some of the OOD data in red, right? So, you know, these red dots will be classified um, as the orange class because they kind of live on the same side um, of the hyperplane. And you might also be wondering, um, you know, why don't we directly uh, estimate the uh, density uh, of our in-distribution data set? Um, well, it turns out there are uh, some unique and interesting challenges um, there too. For example, deep generative models uh, in some uh, cases, especially when we're dealing with uh, more complex high resolution images, they can be quite difficult to optimize. Um, and even if you can train it to converge, I think Eric has this very interesting study um, back in 2018 that showed OOD data in some cases can trigger um, higher likelihood um, than the in-distribution data. And lastly, the images in the real world um, can be uh, a lot more complex, right? They're composed of many, many different objects and components. To give you an example, this is an image from um, MS Coco that shows you know, you can see there are, you know, uh, the pedestrians and cars, road signs and trees in the background, uh, some traffic signs, which is not very much uh, visible. And there is a, a, a helicopter for some reason, you know, on, on the road. Um, and so, you know, if you look at this image um, and apply this, you know, um, self-driving car model, um, you have to distinguish, right, at the very finer grain level of what is in distribution versus OOD, because some parts of the image could be in distribution, like the pedestrians and, and cars, um, which was, you know, the, the categories that the model was trained to perform. Um, but, you know, like this helicopter was never seen. Um, so therefore, it, it can cause, you know, some of the issue here. So over the years, we have seen uh, a surge of interest uh, in this challenging problem space. Um, and it's really encouraging and great to see a thriving literature on OOD detection. And so very recently, we uh, composed a, a survey paper that tries to summarize and uh, covers the methodologies developed in the space so far. Um, and if you're interested, um, please uh, check this out. And I'll try to unpack uh, some of these um, in, in this talk. And so the earliest work uh, adopted this post-hoc approach for OOD detection. And so what does that mean? Uh, let me give you a method overview. And so a, a model is typically trained on the um, in-distribution data, say Cypher 10 using empirical risk minimization. And once the model is trained, um, let's take the network as it is without modifying its parameters. And so during inference time for any given input, um, we're going to devise a scoring function um, S for OOD detection. And if it's below certain threshold, uh, we're gonna reject this input. And otherwise uh, we can produce the class prediction as usual. And so, you know, in other words, we're, we're performing a level set um, estimation based on this score here. And so the advantage of uh, post hoc OOD detection is that uh, it does not interfere with um, our original task, such as classification. And it provides this uh, kind of uh, additional safety layer almost um, for free. And this is also a, a kind of a key, uh, I would say, you know, conceptually uh, different from um, traditional work on anomaly detection, 
which in some cases uh, treat, you know, does not discriminate uh, among different classes by treating everything as one class. And so here, you know, you can think of the, the, the overall goal being two folds. One is we wanted you to do well in the classification task. And in addition, we want to have this kind of binary classifier for OOD detection. So that's the setup here. And a common baseline is to use the softmax confidence score, uh, which is the largest posterior probability from the model. Uh, but it has some of these um, issues. Uh, as we saw earlier, right, the model tends to produce this overconfident predictions. And therefore, um, you see that um, in this uh, dash red circle highlighted, um, it's very difficult to kind of draw a threshold somewhere to, to separate these two types of data between in distribution and OOD. And so our early work on ODing tries to address this issue by using temperature scaling and input pre-processing. And the key insight here is that a large temperature has a strong uh, smoothing effect and it will make this softmax distributions uh, more separable between the in-distribution and OOD. Uh, and we'll provide some mathematical explanations for this in the paper. And so in hindsight, um, what we realized that what Alden is really trying to do is to push the softmax score back to the logit space. And uh, in our uh, Europe's paper last year, we took this insight even further. So um, we proposed this energy-based framework, uh, which derives um, the energy score from the, uh, the logit output of the neural network. Right? So that's, that's the key here. As you see the function of f of x, that's pre-softmax. Um, and so I'm gonna dive into this work in a little bit more detail and walk you through some of the components. And so energy-based uh, model um, has been around uh, for decades. Um, the it was first introduced to machine learning in the 80s. Um, and to give you some background, um, an energy function would take an input, say uh, my cat and corresponding label, uh, which is a cat. And it would produce, go through this function here and produce a scalar, which we call energy. And so this energy basically measures the compatibility between X and Y, right? the input and the, the label, and should give you a lower value if there is a high compatibility. Right? So if this indeed match each other, uh, you would expect the energy to be quite low. And so this function can be non-probabilistic. Um, you can, of course, turn this into a probability form. Uh, through the Gibbs distribution. Um, and so again, this is the same equation that I showed in the last slide. And if you look at this denominator, which is also known as the partition function, um, this basically takes the integral over all the possible y's right, in this uh, output space. And this free energy is uh, defined as the negative of the log partition function. And again, this, this notion has been around for a long time, nothing new here. Um, and so how is this energy-based model related to neural networks? Um, so that's the interesting question to ask here. So it turns out that a neural network can be uh, interpreted from an energy-based perspective. And so let's consider a neural network here that is producing uh, the output logits, F1, F2, um, and so on. And so these are the pre-softmax output. And then if you apply this softmax function, it basically normalizes things and produce a uh, probabilistic vector, P of Y conditioned on X, and this can sum over to one. And so recall that this is the, the definition of um, softmax, which we have seen uh, in this talk uh, several times. And so now if you define um, energy function E of X comma Y to be the negative of the logit output, effectively this turns into um, something. Um, 
that's more familiar we saw earlier right the, this energy form and so recall this is how free energy was um, defined and in the context of a neural network the free energy replaces this integral with the summation across uh, k discrete labels and so for every input and some neural network um, could be parameterized by theta we can calculate this um, using the log sum exp uh, exponential operation. So we're taking the exponential of the um, each of the logit, sum of them, sum them up, and then um, take the uh, negate the sign. So that's how free energy can be calculated from a neural network. And so in this work, the key idea really is to replace the softmax confidence. Um, which you know produces this non-distinguishable score distribution uh, with energy, um, and with energy scores, this the distribution um, has kind of stronger separability, um, and in particular, you no longer see this um, spiky distribution that concentrate on around one, um, as you know, as we saw for a softmax score. Um, and this, in this plot, we're showing, we flip the sign uh, to show this negative energy uh, just to, you know, just so that in distribution has higher score and vice versa. Um, and as you can see here, then if we have a threshold, um, let's say tau, and then you can perform this comparison uh, based on the negative energy score to uh, differentiate between the in distribution and OOD. And so to um, evaluate and uh, compare our approach, uh, primarily with the um, softmax confidence score, uh, in this case, we trained a model on the uh, Cypher 10 data set um, as in distribution and evaluate on SVHN. Um, and um, the measurement or the um, how to measure the performance is based on the notion of FPR95, which is defined at the follow. Um, and so, uh, you can pick this threshold um, where you have this true positive rate of 95%, which means 95% of the in-distribution data is greater than the threshold. And then you can look at the fraction of OOD data, in this case, in SVHN, that is misclassified as in-distribution. So that's FPR95. And you want that fraction of misclassification to be as low as possible. So in this case, um, softmax score gives uh, an FPR around uh, 48.87 or so. So it's, it's actually a quite challenging task, right? If you, if you look at this um, density distribution here. Um, and uh, on the right side, we're contrasting with um, energy, which is able to reduce the um, FPR um, down to 35% or so. And, uh, we evaluated uh, more broadly um, on uh, more data sets. Uh, and it's important for OD detection because, you know, as I said, there's a large space of unknowns. So in general, evaluating on a diverse data set would give you kind of a better idea on, you know, how well your method and algorithm is actually doing. And so you see here across uh, the six different test data sets, uh, we're able to see um, meaningful and uh, consistent uh, improvement here um, as opposed to softmax school. Um, and just to also uh, uh, remind you, I think the advantage of the approach um, is that it's very easy to use. You can you know, derive that very conveniently through just uh, one line of code of log sum EXP operation. And compared to some other previous uh, baselines, um, this one does not require hyperparameter tuning. Um, it gives actually almost similar, even better performance. Um, um, and now, Sarah, uh -huh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. There is a question in the chat. Uh -huh, go uh, ahead. From Heaven Huang. It says, do you know how's max logit working compared to the energy scores on logits? 
That's a great question. I, actually, it depends a lot on the uh, entire probability distribution, uh, entire logit distribution. And so mathematically, you can approximate this energy function, right? When you have a very skewed distribution of values, uh, this log sum exp can be mathematically approximated by this maximum logit, but it doesn't always hold true, right? If you have a more kind of smooth distribution, uh, this is not equivalent. Um, so actually, I'm going to talk in more detail in the in the theoretical explanation part of why this energy is more advantageous kind of from a you know um, theoretical perspective that has very clear meaning from a density perspective than using max logit um that's a great question so um so now I wanted to kind of provide some, uh, as I said, um, explanation, right? Why softmax score is less desirable or suboptimal for OD detection. And so in order to explain this, we can look at the uh, training dynamics of uh, neural networks in terms of how they change the um, energy state of the output. And so this is the standard across entropy loss for classification. Uh, you're essentially taking the negative log probability corresponding to the ground truth label. And you can skip the details, but if we derive the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters theta, um, what I want to highlight is that the training dynamics essentially tries to pull down the energy for our training data. Um, and now if we look at the softmax score, or more precisely, the log of the softmax, um, it can be uh, decomposed into two terms. Um, the first term is the energy, which as I saw, as we see earlier, is gonna be lower, right? Um, and the second term is the maximum logit, uh, which is gonna be higher for in distribution. And uh, because these two terms are pulling things in the opposite directions. And so this overall summation results in a, a, a biased function that's no longer uh, suitable uh, for OOD detection. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I wanted to use this uh, you know, very simple data model to kind of explain uh, the advantage of using energy form uh, over, you know, maximum softmax probability or even max uh, logit. And so we can make this analysis very, very precise by having a concrete data model, right? So for simplicity, let's say uh, we can have an in-distribution data uh, model that's a mixture of Gaussian. Uh, so the simplicity is uh, desirable because it allows us to precisely characterize the behavior of different OOD uh, scoring functions, right? And typically, if you're trying to analyze the exact behavior of, of neural networks, uh, it can be quite difficult due to the stochasticity of the optimization and so on. So here we're trying to kind of isolate this to, to see things more clearly. So now let's see, um, we have a, a, a mixture with K different classes and uh, and we have this equal prior uh, probability one over K and each of the class, um, you can write out this, you know, the class conditional density form explicitly. Um, this is the standard multivariate Gaussian distribution, um, which is nothing new here. And so based on this in distribution, um, uh, we can write out uh, this um, base optimal classifier, right? If you were to actually train the classification on this uh, on this data model, uh, the base optimal classifier produces the posterior p of y uh, equals i condition on this input in this form, um, and this is uh, essentially plugging the class priors um, and the class conditional density that we saw earlier, and so you can re you know be simplified into this form. And now if you see that uh, we plug in this definition of you know, energy, which is the log um, sum, summation over this exponential, um, it's actually aligned with this um, log of data density under this particular data model, right? Um, and so if you take you know, maximum logit, it doesn't have this kind of you know, 
the exact uh, meaning. It does not correspond exactly to this data density. So that's why this is kind of more desirable and has a clear meaning. Um, and you can also write out, for example, the explicit form of uh, maximum softmax score um, by plugging this you know, density function uh, that you saw earlier. And you can easily derive that it's not aligned with Pn. Um, and lastly, I just want to show you this very simple, uh, you know, toy uh, example in this one-dimensional case because I think this is the 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 straight, most straightforward example to show you what's what's going on here. Um, so the gray line in the middle is the end distribution, and so this density function is a mixture of uh, two Gaussian, right? It's centered around x, uh, centered around two and minus two. So the density for function is given uh, also mathematically here. And based on this density function, you can derive, for example, the maximum softmax score, uh, which is shown at the top. And interestingly, you can see that if you look at the far out when x takes on uh, some of the large values like x is greater than four or smaller than minus four. Um, even though your ground truth density, right, becomes very small, almost close to zero, the MSP can still be quite large, um, which is essentially one there. Um, and so this would correspond to the, um, the false positives, which means they should be classified as OOD, um, but end up being misclassified as in distribution. Uh, whereas using this um, energy form, it's uh, well aligned with the with the density here. Um, so this is a. Uh, a oh, Tali, go ahead. Yeah, there's another question from uh -huh. the chat. It's from Jella. Uh, it's a very long question. Would you like to ask yourself, Jella, if you have a mic? No. Uh, okay, I'll read it. Read it for right. you. We can also, if uh, if you like, we can also take it in the end. If you know, maybe. Yeah, I think it's uh, suitable to, for the end. It's a general okay. question. Okay, sounds good. I'll try to leave some time in the end to address those. Um, cool. So um, this is a, another kind of uh, follow up work that we did, uh, which shows you can leverage energy, uh, not just for multi-class classification, right? Where images, you know, assume to belong to one and only one class. Um, you can uh, actually derive and estimate um, these OOD score uh, for multi-label classification, uh, which is more suitable for scenarios where uh, an image could have, you know, multiple uh, labels associated. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the details here, uh, but is something I wanted to briefly mention. And so perhaps I want to use the remainder of the talk uh, to share with you, I, I think, some of the uh, really interesting opportunities uh, in this problem space. Um, so we have talked about, you know, uh, some algorithmic solutions to OOD detection. Um, but often a, quest, uh, a question that's left in unanswered or in mysteries, uh, why neural network produce this overconfident uh, predictions on OOD data? And answering some of these questions uh, requires to actually uh, examine uh, and look at how um, the internal activation and mechanism uh, works, right? How neural networks are actually trained and evaluated. To give you an example, um, I wanted to share some, uh, uh, I think, quite interesting insights from a recent work uh, with my student, uh, Io Sun, and also Tron uh, from Facebook. And uh, this is one plausible kind of, you know, uh, explanation that we're trying to uh, provide in this in this work. Um, and uh, our, our our kind of expert uh, expect is from the batch norm. Um, we look at how batch normalization, which is a, a commonly used um, technique, uh, 
employed in training neural networks. And we will look at how these affect the internal activations. And for those of you who are not familiar with how batch norm works, um, it's quite straightforward. So during training time, uh, the network uh, tries to estimate the, uh, the, the mean and variance right, for each of this kind of unit uh, in, the, in this network. And so this normalization helps uh, stabilize um, the training process. And once this uh, training is done, uh, we end up having this, you know, batch norm statistics that you can plug into this inference time. And so during inference time, for every, you know, batch of data, you basically subtract this uh, mean and divide it by the spheres that was estimated on the in-distribution data. And so everything works perfect, perfectly fine if, you know, your test data comes from the same uh, distribution as the training data, right? So that's, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, but the issue happens when you have this mismatched batch norm statistics. So let's say you have some, you know, OOD test examples um, and you're applying, right? Uh, keep in mind that you're applying the same statistics that were actually estimated in distribution data. And this turns out to trigger uh, some of the abnormally high uh, unit activations. Um, and this, you know, when this activation all adds up, it will lead to kind of very high uh, output value in the output space. And so to see a concrete example here, to make things uh, more straightforward, uh, we can look at the activation pattern in the penultimate layer of the neural network. So this is the feature layer right before, uh, right before the output. And uh, let's say we have uh, M dimensional feature vector. And in this plot, uh, we show the distribution of activations uh, for ImageNet trained model. And each point in this axis corresponds to a single unit. And so if we have 512 dimension, this will correspond to you know, 512 units. And for each of the units, we plot the mean, which is a solid blue line, and the variance right, indicated in shade. And similarly, we can look at on average how each unit responds to the OOD data. Again, the model is trained on ImageNet. We're not changing the parameterization of the network, just kind of feed in a, a mismatched distribution, which is from iNaturalist in this case. <clears throat> and these images do not belong to any um, ImageNet categories. And so we plot them, uh, again, the mean and standard deviations uh, in this solid gray line and, and the shaded area. And so if we put them together, right, let's contrast these activation patterns. Uh, we see that the activation for in distribution in blue um, is uh, well behaved with a near constant mean and, uh, and a standard deviation. And in contrast, uh, for this OOD data in gray, <laughs> the mean activation has uh, significantly larger uh, variations uh, across units. Um, and is biased towards having these sharp positive values, as you see in some of the, you know, units there, it should have really high. And so it turns out these high unit activations can, uh, um, you know, uh, consequently be manifested in the model output. Like I said, if you add up a bunch of very, very high values, you're going to end up getting, you know, overconfident predictions. So that's, uh, this is summarized the what's happening here. And so this observation on the unit activation uh, leads to uh, one of the solution, uh, which is quite simple, but um, surprisingly effective, which we call rectified um, activations or uh, react um, for short. And the key idea is to perform this activation truncation at a certain threshold let's say C, and so you see those Caesars here, basically that eclipse out the, um, the activation that's beyond certain threshold. And this can be done on a pre-trained model without any modification to the training process. Um, and this react operation is applied um, element-wise to each of the, the activation value. 
And of course, a higher C, higher threshold indicates uh, a larger threshold of activation truncation. And in the extreme case, when C goes into infinity, you're preserving kind of the original activation here. And so now you have this kind of H bar, H bar, that's the truncated uh, feature vector. Um, and then the model output uh, can be calculated by just having the linear transformation uh, on top of this um, truncated activation, right? So that's a new output, which we call F react. And during test time, uh, this uh, method can be leveraged by, you know, different downstream, different OOD scoring functions. For example, you can apply this to the energy function that we have just saw earlier, or it could be, you know, maximum softmax probability. And in all these cases, um, React is able to um, improve the performance. So for example, uh, we compare React um, with um, several post hoc methods that are quite competitive uh, in the literature, including the energy score that we talked about. Um, and for a fair comparison, all of these methods use um, the pre-trained uh, networks right, post hoc. Um, and uh, it's the same kind of parameterization across all these uh, methods. The only variation is the scoring function. And so you see that um, React reduces the uh, false positive rate by 25% uh, on average across, um, across this four test uh, data sets that we have here. Um, so it's, it's quite significant and, uh, and effective. All right. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, I think, uh, there are let's, let's take uh, questions uh, maybe. Yeah, there's a few point. questions here. Stop. Uh, there's one from Roman. It says, is there such plant normally happening at the penultimate layer of neural net? When it's presented with all the example, why don't we use some statis statistic calculated on these activations to detect all the Ah, that's a great question. That's a great question. It's actually, um, you know, one of the solutions if you do have a, a bunch of uh, let's say a batch of OOD, right? It allows you to estimate this, uh, the, the statistics. We indeed perform this experiment. Um, so this could be, let's say, an oracle when you have sufficient amount of OOD that allows you to estimate this uh, mean, re-estimate this mean variation of variance, right? Um, but this has limitations when you're trying to perform this, let's say, the single input Right. It, it, it does not apply if you only have a single OOD scenario. It doesn't allow you to kind of estimate that um, easily. And so this, this is kind of a, a method that does not depend on any knowledge. It does not require a batch of OOD to be available. And we actually show, if you're interested, you can check out section six in the paper that shows our method, even without re-estimating the statistics can do uh, pretty closely compared to, you know, having access to the true OOD statistics. But that's an excellent question. Um, there is another question from Luis. Is uh -huh. in the data on top from training or test versus OOD? From, so ID is, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. In distribution data. Uh -huh. Is in distribution data on top from training or test versus OOD? Uh, in the so here the evaluation is performed on the the, the test set of in distribution. Does that answer the question, Luis? So during test time, you take the test uh, set of your in distribution and then take this OOD, um, and the goal is to kind of perform binary predictions to separate those two. Okay, and uh, with the statistics, let's say if you're trying to estimate these st statistics, these are estimated on the training data. Thanks. Uh, I think there's another question from uh, Rajiv. Uh, overconfidence, overconfidence happens for models with no batch norm. For example, uh, in NLP models, what do you think what might be causing overconfidence there? Oh, that's an actually a very intriguing question that I perhaps, I would be very interested in delving deeper there. 
Uh, I think for now, a lot of this work we've explored so far is, you know, primarily based on, you know, image classification models. And NLP is a very exciting kind of, you know, area, especially nowadays, this transformer-based uh, model, right, using non-CN architectures. Um, so I think that would be a very kind of interesting uh, future area to look into the, the fundamental costs there. That's Thanks. a great question. Uh, I think the final question from JLab. It says, why does React use a truncation of the output instead of a renormalization, which would maintain the relative amplitudes of the signals and presumably minimize the output some even further for all the inputs? Right, I think this question was related to someone else asked earlier. Um, to, in order to re-estimate the statistics, you could do that, right? If you have, you know, uh, this uh, a batch of OOD available, you could recalculate the mean and variance. Um, the, I guess the limitation there is, you know, you don't always necessarily have a, a batch of OOD comes in, right? If you're doing this on a single test sample based test, um, it's, it's not very applicable. Um, and so React is kind of approximation um, for that. It gets around this issue. So maybe let me continue. I wanted to uh, spend, let me see if I can finish this in the uh, next 15 or maybe less, and then we can open up and take all the remainder questions if that's okay. By the way, all these are fantastic questions. So thank you for raising those. Um, so uh, I think, you know, going beyond uh, these post hoc methods. Uh, I personally think these, uh, there's uh, exciting opportunities for um, exploring training time regularization. Um, and so post hoc methods are uh, effective, but they may not be sufficient to uh, fundamentally address this issue. Um, and this is because existing learning algorithms are primarily trained um, and optimized um, to kind of you know, maximize the, the accuracy on the ID data. And this resultant decision boundary in this case for three-way classification, even though it does perfectly on the ID classification, it can be yield faded for OOD detection. And so we need this training time regularization to somehow explicitly account for the uncertainty outside the in-distribution data. And so this ideal decision boundary should be something like the right side um, which is more aligned with the uh, with the data density here, like this, you know, the the Gaussian like um, distribution. And so, how do we achieve that? Uh, one way to do this is using um, uh, what we propose: the energy regularized through learning. And so, here we have this two objectives in the training time: one for classification using the standard cross entropy loss, and the other one for um, which intends to maximize the separability between the in-distribution and OOD. And so originally we had this uh, regularization loss based on the squared hinge loss form, um, which tries to push the energy to be lower than certain threshold for ID data and vice versa. And so this result uh, in more separable distributions between ID and OOD. And so as you see on the right side of this figure, um, this is when we actually employ this training time regularization, the OOD performance is kind of drastically improved as opposed to rely on this post hoc score derived from the models that's just trained with cross entropy loss. Again, here in distribution is cipher 10 and OOD is SVHN. And of course, there is one limitation in this type of, uh, you know, approach, which also, you know, is, uh, if you see the subjective here, it relies on some outlier training data, right? Which, um, which uh, is can't be, a, you know, a, a strong assumption to make um, in practice, especially you don't have access to, you know, such outlier training data, or it requires some, you know. Uh, data cleaning, which you know, have to really go through the samples to make sure they don't overlap with the ID data and can be expensive in practice. And so this motivates a, a new work, which I'm also quite excited about called 
uh, virtual licenses. Uh, it was recently released on archive uh, just a few days ago. Um, so the key idea or the key motivation here is really how can we uh, you know, generate some useful outliers that can help us better regularize our classifiers or the decision boundary without any, you know, requirement access to external data. And so the key idea in this paper, um, which I really liked about is to um, perform the sampling. Um, so we try to estimate this uh, data density uh, in the feature space, which has lower dimensionality compared to the input space. And so it's more tractable to estimate the density in some in the feature space as, a, as opposed to you know estimate or training again in the original feature uh, in pixel space. So here we sample the outliers denoted in black um, from the low likelihood region of this estimated um, distribution. And so once you have this Gaussian parametric model, you can explicitly calculate this likelihood. And these outliers are sampled with some, you know, likelihood score smaller than certain threshold. And so I'm going to skip some of the details, um, but uh, at a high level, um, this is a really flexible and general framework that can be uh, suitable for both object detection um, and uh, image classification task, which we show in the paper um, to be effective on, on both. Right? So the idea is, you know, to have this classification loss. And on top of that, we train uh, this uh, regularization to pull apart the energy um, between the in-distribution and the synthesized virtual outliers. Um, so to give you some um, example here, uh, this is a, um, kind of a uh, contrast on uh, input of this uh, horse image um, without OD detection. It has this misclassification of predicting that to be a pedestrian. And on the right hand side, it's able to you know, flag that as OD. And similarly, I think the, the bottom figure shows how this, I don't know how come this uh, shoes is floating there, but uh, this is an image from again, MS Coco. Uh, that's able to be flagged as, as OD. Uh, this is another example of uh, having this, you know, uh, being misclassified as truck um, to be detected as OD um, successfully. So we have open source this work. Um, this is the GitHub link uh, if you're interested in checking out. And this also leads to kind of my next point, uh, which I hinted a little bit early in this talk is I do think there's a great opportunity for the field to think about how do we mo move toward a more realistic data model. Um, I think object detection is one example of that. Um, and uh, some of the limitations right, for Cypher benchmark is uh, they're typically low resolution and the, the class space is relatively small. And so the data set is not very reflective of the visual complexity observed in the real world. And uh, so in the real world, images will come from much larger semantic space, uh, which much higher resolution. And so uh, it would be, you know, we asked this question, can we actually do OD detection for image net um, scale of, you know, data set? Um, as it turns out, it's, it's, it's not quite that easy. Um, so if you just plug in this baseline of using maximum softmax probability, uh, this ARC, the performance would decrease uh, quite rapidly as you increase the number of classes on the x-axis. And so this intuitively because the decision boundary right between your in-distribution and um, OOD becomes a lot more complex here. And so this is a, a kind of recent work. Uh, we're trying to develop um, algorithmic solutions to improve uh, uh, the, um, this performance on this challenging task. Um, as you can see, the blue curve um, is um, our proposed approach called MOS, uh, which is scales um, more effectively as the number of classes increases. And as part of the paper, we also released uh, this ImageNet-based benchmark. Um, and here's the link if you're interested in checking out uh, and building even better solutions uh, on top of this um, task, which I think is still kind of a a large room of, you know, exciting uh, innovation in terms of solution.
Um, yeah, I think maybe I think I'll briefly touch upon on this in two minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, the last opportunity I just want to mention is, um, I think it'll be very important, you know, as a community to think about how do we better formalize this notion of OOD, right? I, you know, I think this question comes up very uh, commonly, what do we mean by OOD? And the issue is actually more complex, more nuanced than we thought. Um, so previously, you know, if we think about any uh, image that contains semantic that's not inside the in-distribution categories will be OOD. Um, you know, that's, you know, a legit type of OOD, but things can get trickier. For example, this is a data set called Waterbirds. And there are two labels, um, Waterbird and Landbird, that are correlated with some background environment, say water and land. And so uh, the spurious correlation exists where 70% of the land birds have this land background and vice versa. And so this training examples, you know, basically is uh, generated by this combination of invariant features, which depends on the semantic label Y, and also this environmental feature, which has nothing to do with the semantic. Um, and so the key point we want to show in this paper is that a model relies on the spurious feature can actually produce this um, high confident prediction for we call a, a spurious OOD, um, which are OOD inputs that have different semantics, say a boat, but it you know shares some of the you know similar environmental features such as the water background. Um, so this type of OOD is much harder to uh, kind of be detected compared to the conventional notion of OOD, like this cat, both the, you know, the semantic and also the kind of contextual environment, um, both are very different from the distribution data. And so, um, in other words, I think moving forward, it's, it's important to explicitly kind of model uh, the data distribution shift by accounting for uh, this invariant features and also environmental features. Um, all right, I, th I think we're perhaps out of time. Uh, this is just some summarization. Maybe I can skip those. And, uh, you know, once again, thank you for staying through the talk. And uh, I'm happy to um, take any remainder questions that you, you may have. Thanks, Jaren, for the excellent talk. And I think there are still some questions in the chat. Uh, first is from Jalal. Would you like to ask a question? Uh, hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Or I can hear you. Okay. Hi, Sharon. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really interesting, and I find this really fascinating. Um, I have a question about adjacency, and I think you mentioned it um, briefly just now at the end of your talk. But my question was, how can you? Uh, is there any research into um, what is the meaning of adjacency in a network, and how you can choose a model to have a meaningful adjacency? So in your outputs, I think you touched on this yourself, but it matters to, to measure an out of distribution sample. It matters that there is a meaning to something being right next to another output and for, for it to be far away. So for example, you could have a person that came very, very far away from your previous in distribution samples, like that's out in the orange samples, for example, where you had in your very early diagram. Is there anything in research to sort of to sort of define how can you constrain the outputs to be adjacent in a meaningful way? That's a great question. I thank you for raising that. Um, I think if I could reframe this notion of uh, adjacency, perhaps from a distance-based perspective. And so there is a kind of line of work in uh, anomaly detection and also OOD uh, detection um, that allows you to uh, measure, for example, for a given test input, um, what is this closeness, right? You can have this notion of uh, closeness relatively, how, uh, how close is this test sample with respect to this in distribution centers? And one way to calculate that uh, could be in the case of, you know, Gaussian mixture model is, um, uh, is uh, this metric, uh, this distance called Mahalanobis distance. Um, so this was employed in the early work by uh, Kaming Lee, right? So once you have this 
uh, notion of uh, distance, perhaps that's closer to what you uh, mean by this uh, adjacency, right? And then you can uh, maybe think about during this training time, if there's, you know, the mechanism of trying to kind of uh, modulate this, um, you know, this adjacency or, or distance, depending on, you know, the specific scenario and problems that you're dealing with. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you know if there's any research that already does that, that tries to, during training time, sort of like push samples together in this higher dimensional abstract space, feature space, instead of uh, just a sort of label and letting it do what it wants? There is, you know, I think you might want to check out some of the recent work uh, that's been done, for example, using contrastive learning. Uh, that's trying to kind of really learn a compact representation space by, you know, pushing all the, you know, data points from the same class into a, you know, very kind of compact region. Um, but I think this notion of, you know, based on what you describe, you also want some mechanism of modulating the distance, you know, between the OD and in distribution. I think that's something I haven't seen, you know, on top of my head, but I think that would be something interesting to explore perhaps. Right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just to add to your response, I think like there, there is a whole approach uh, called the like triplet loss learning that uh, actually tries to uh, minimize the distance between like the positive class uh, embeddings and uh, maximize the distance between the negative class embeddings. Uh, right, different right, right. embeddings. So that might be interesting to consider if you're interested in this. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, this is also related to this, for example, this, uh, this, uh, for example, the supervised contrastive loss. There's a framework called SSD. I think that's built on this contrastive learning loss um, that has this similar spirit of pulling, you know, together the positive samples and then repel, right, between the input and the, the, the negative samples. So I think those are all relevant literature that you could check out. Thank you, that's great. Uh, all right, there are, uh, I think, a few questions from Haiwen Huang. Would you like to ask your questions? Uh, yeah. Um, oh, so thank you. Uh, and uh, the, the first question is on the VOS method. So um, from the pictures you, you showed, like the results, I find that uh, VOS also like can they can also influence the like the object proposals right uh, like um, some objects they are not detected before but they are detected after the VOS or like uh, they were detected but now they are not is that true? Yeah, that's a great question. So because this regularization is employed during the training time, right? So uh, we're essentially training this uh, you know when we're optimizing this entire fast RCA network everything is jointly optimized. And so uh, this would have kind of an influence on the uh, decision boundary and the, the confidence um, as well. So actually an interesting uh, observation, which as you point out is uh, for the spawning box, right? Um, there is this, I would say, uh, 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 the problem which we call open proposal detection. Uh, which is how do you actually identify all the possible, you know, objects, uh, bounding box proposals that are actually meaningful, even for those unseen uh, object. And so I think that's actually something, uh, you know, quite, not quite, um, you know, uh, uh, soft yet um, in this, in this, I would say the current line of research. But you're right, this would definitely uh, influence the, the the bounding box and the confidence on the end distribution uh, prediction as well. Yeah, uh, sorry. So you mean the object proposal problem is kind of uh, solved? No, I think that's actually still an open problem. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and another question is about that um, uh, later slide. Um, you show that when their class number um, increases, yeah. Uh, uh, it becomes yeah the, it becomes more and more difficult to maintain the um, OD detection performance. So uh, my question is I, I I can't really like understand this because I think like OD data they should um, kind of like reside far away from the decision boundaries of the classes and or like they should like be class agnostic. So why why do you think like um, this increase in number of classes would influence this OD detection performance? 
Oh, that's uh, thank you for that question. So, you know, actually in the in the realistic case, uh, when let's say let's pull out this right side of the slide. And so it's not necessarily true that all the data would live very far off from the distribution classes. And in fact, to give you an extreme example, let's say you have uh, a class label of a, you know, like a cat and, and a dog. Um, and if you provide it with some uh, image, say a fox, right, it has some of these similar visual features as, um, let's say, the cat. And so in that case, it's actually in the embedding space will be very close to some of the uh, in distribution um, samples and not necessarily far away. And as you imagine, right, as your class um, space uh, starts to kind of expand the decision boundary, right? We, we say the decision boundary between in distribution, say if you want to draw some kind of, uh, you know, this periphery that just carve out your in distribution classes that decision boundary becomes a lot, lot more complex as you're adding more stuff to the to the data distribution there. So that's why the problem becomes, uh, you know, a lot trickier. I see. Um, can I also say that, um, uh, like from your example, basically, uh, this is like more like a, um, how, how do you define OD? Uh, if it's uh, like fox compared to dog and cat, this kind of OD, they might uh, like be close to the boundary, but if it's like a, uh, say like um, um like non-natural images or like completely uh, different image, I I can't really think of an example right now. But like maybe it's not an animal; it's like a car or something. So yeah, I get what you mean. A, doesn't have any like features, uh, uh, like um, yeah, doesn't have any same features with dogs or cats. Will they like be really far away? Right. So, you know, to, to let me, uh, you know, decompose the answer into two parts. So first, right, how do you define? So both are legit OOD because the semantic, right, in both cases are uh, not, you know, occurred in the, in the you know, training categories, say cats and, and dog. And so there is this notion of, you know, semantic closeness and that you can, for example, be captured uh, in the, um, the one way to describe this would be based on, let's say, uh, WordNet, right? WordNet has, you know, all the possible nuns that you could encounter to describe the, the word. And there's this natural hierarchy that comes with this WordNet. Um, and that's a tree structure, right? If it's in different part of the tree and or the depth is, you know, larger than something, that means the semantic is going to be kind of further apart. So that's one way of, you know, defining in the semantic space how far things part are. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a quite nice way to think of it. Yeah, yeah, we actually have this, you know, we leverage in this work, right, the way that how the algorithm works actually relies on this taxonomy of the of the classes, although we're just using kind of the first level of the grouping here, but you know, you, you can certainly have much, much finer grained way of, you know, categorizing and defining this taxonomy. Yeah, and, and also like from this uh, the results is also very intriguing. Like a uh, like iNaturalist, I think they look much close, like closer to ImageNet. But, uh, but textures, they should be like really class agnostic, um, <laughs> and like they they should be much more different than iNaturalist com uh, compared to I I ImageNet. I think. But right now it, we can see that like texture seems to me more sensitive to the number of classes. So that's, yeah, that's a great observation. I think it may has to do with the fact that texture is more of a lower level. It's less of a semantic, you know, data set yeah. as opposed oh, to the right. other. Yeah. yeah. That's a great observation. Do we have time for another question? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically to, to sample good OD examples, uh, like an embedded space, uh, you would probably need the like, for for the ID data for the in distribution data to be uh, quite condensed to be like grouped in in, in some kind of like tight clusters. But uh, since you're doing this on training training stage, this could not be the case you know, for some for some cases. And this would be especially true on like some uh, hard problems like image net classifications, uh, especially on the early training epochs. So how do you uh, like overcome this uh, potential problem? That's an excellent question. I really like that. So 
Uh, you're right. Indeed, this approach, right, underlying depends on this uh, the the feature uh, uh, feature space estimation and the way we kind of uh, approximate or estimate that is uh, through this dynamic online estimation. So you can imagine that the beginning of the training process, the, when the embedding space is not quite well formed yet, um, this you know the sampling is is not going to be very effective. Uh, but we kind of, you know, uh, as the training goes on, we're always re-estimating this um, Gaussian mixture model as the training goes on. So that's kind of one way to um, improve, right, over time on this um, estimated density. Um, and as we kind of reach closer to um, the convergence or when this meaningful cluster um, starts to emerge in the embedding space, that's when this estimation becomes more uh effective and also sampling it right, becomes more effective um and you're right i think there is definitely the challenge of uh scaling this up to kind of you know many many classes and that's where actually this this type of um uh gmm estimation uh, becomes i think more troublesome in the in the um high class space so definitely you know um still you know uh open problems to solve there Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, would you say that if you would sample like some OD examples in the early stages of model training, and uh, inevitably you would uh, uh, end up with some OD examples, uh, which are quite close to the in distribution for the current stage of training, uh, when there are no like uh, clear clusters uh, yet formed. And uh, since you have like this regularization term in your uh, like loss function, uh, wouldn't it uh, make like training uh, of the network uh, a bit harder because you would like uh, um, penalize uh, like good, good prediction in somewhere like where it is actually an in the distribution region? Excellent, another excellent question. So it could, it, it could definitely, you know, um, actually, uh, influence the training. So the way we get around that issue is to say, you don't have to start uh, employing or adding that regularization right away at the at the beginning of the training. So we do have this uh, uh, kind of hyperparameter in this training uh, algorithm where you start adding on this loss function, perhaps let's say uh, two thirds um, uh, after this training um, epochs are done. When you have a relatively well-formed embedding space, that's when it gets more effective when you start adding this regularization. So that's that's a useful strategy um, to to mitigate the issue you, you just mentioned. Okay, thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Thank yeah. you. Great question. All right. Uh, I think there was a last question from Luis. Would you like to ask your question? Luis? Sure. Yes, sorry. I'm finding the unmute button. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really nice. And um, I just had a, a, a bit the uh, question around the interpretation of the the VOS results that you sh um, showed at the end. So um, we had this uh, shout out to Eric's paper at the beginning with the likelihoods and um, their kind of this intriguing property that they found for the deep generative models and like how the model basically treats the images might be different from how we characterize them as in and out of distribution. And now in VOS you use this likelihood regularization and i was curious like how how do you explain like the success for vos but then at the same time we see the difficulty in the generative models like how does this fit together thank, uh, you. So thank you for that great question uh, so i think one key distinction when you know when we contrast vos versus uh, the steep generative model based approach is the fact that vos is still a discriminative based approach which means the it has this uh, I would say unfair advantage of having access to the labeling uh, information, whereas in the in the you know if you're trying to estimate this in using a completely generative fashion, uh, you don't necessarily have that. Um, and so that's um, I think that's one of the kind of um, key information that actually provides uh, more information, and it's also in the uh, uh, that provides more information right from a just data perspective and optimization perspective these um, discrete models are um, a lot easier um, typically just to train with um, train with sgd and so uh, if you know if you're uh, if we're able to kind of estimate a reasonably good embedding space 
from the penultimate layer of this discriminative uh, model, then you know Voss becomes kind of more plausible in that sense. And another, I think another in, intriguing, interesting, I think related to Eric's paper is the fact that is the fact that when you're trying to train these generative models, right, the the model inherently encourage um, uh, these, or so the how the learning objectives formulated is to kind of force the model to be able to at least reconstruct all this, for example, pixels, right? So, so that's different from the objective of discriminative model, um, where you know you don't have to get all the pixel. Uh, Correct. Whereas in the different models, there is this tendency of overfitting to, for example, background information just to get that reconstruction loss low. And this is one of the issue I think like like likelihood ratio paper I think interestingly tries to kind of uh, mitigate um, as well. Um, and that's an issue I think you know discriminant model is kind of less prone to suffer. All right. Uh, I think that's uh, a lot of questions today. And uh, let's thank Sharon again for the amazing talk. And uh, thank you, everyone, who joined us today and for the excellent discussion today. And uh, see you next time for another AD4SD seminar. And 